The rest of you guys, we're going to be open up to Luke chapter 19, as we heard this morning. And this morning and Friday evening and Sunday morning next week, we'll be in the book of Luke uh, as we prepare our hearts for this holiday uh, that seems to have creeped up on us really quickly. We were in our city group and we were talking. Uh, I guess I was just naive to the fact that Easter can be in March. I had no idea. I always just assumed for whatever reason it was the first Sunday in April. And here we are in March preparing for Easter. Um, and we don't know who decides those. I would love to be on that committee on who decides when holidays fall with when. I just open up my phone and say, oh, that's when this holiday is. But for whatever reason, they decided March 31st is a good day for Easter this year. Um, probably because of the eclipse and all the people that are be coming in town. And uh, we were also talking in our city group just about how many people we're expecting to see in Indiana. And uh, conservative numbers say 500,000. Most numbers say close to a million people are going to be coming into Indianapolis and surrounding counties to see the eclipse this season. And uh, we were talking about ways we can kind of capitalize on that. I'll be going and buying a case of water and selling it for $3 a bottle if you get thirsty. So... But no, I mean, welcoming people into our city, welcoming people into our state is not something that we in the Midwest are unfamiliar with. We're often known for our Midwest hospitality. It's something we do well. We take pride in it. And our city specifically does, I think, a good job. You just look at cities in general and you consider ours and all the stuff that we host. And I think we do a good job at it. You just think of like the NFL Combine that just happened. March Madness is happening right now. We hosted the Super Bowl several years ago. NBA All-Star Weekend was just recently hosted. And you see all of the stuff that we do. We do a really good job at hosting people in our city. And that brings us to our text this morning. We kind of see at least a little bit um, some hospitality going on in the city of Jerusalem. This, this week and this day is really preparing for a celebration. The city of Jerusalem would welcome in thousands and thousands of guests this week in preparation for what we call today Holy Week or Passion Week. They were celebrating Passover. And this is when Jesus enters the scene. He makes his triumphal entry. He proclaims his messiahship. And as we see this morning, it seems like this great, festive, exciting scene. But we know today, as the scene progresses, this week turns into something that was far from what many would have expected. So that's where we find ourselves this week. We're going to be in Luke this morning. Um, what we're going to do this morning is a little bit different than what makes me comfortable. If you've heard me preach before, I like picking long passages of text and just kind of working through it because I don't like to make up stuff to say. I just kind of want to show you what the Bible says. Um, but what we're going to do this morning is we're going to zoom in on the context of, of what's going on in our passage in Luke. So we'll zoom in. We'll consider a little bit of it. I'll show you some details about it. And then we're going to zoom out, and the majority of our time this morning is going to be spent zoomed out, kind of considering some, some deeper principles uh, that might be at play here and, and how they apply to our lives. So before we begin, though, let's, uh, let's pray and ask for the Lord's help. Father, we thank you um, for the privilege it is to gather together as your people, uh, and namely the privilege it is to gather together and reflect on and remember the events that transpired some 2,000 years ago on this day, on this week, and into next week. And Lord, we just ask uh, that for those of us that maybe feel rushed into this, we, we haven't really prepared our hearts and our minds for Easter and, and the coming days, Lord, we just ask that you would prepare our hearts. Um, allow us to receive and meditate on and apply the truths that we see in this week in history. Help us to, to look at what Jesus did in his triumphal entry. Help us to reflect on how this week transpired for our Savior. And then with joyful hearts and a hope that surpasses all knowledge, let us rejoice in the work that he did on the cross. And so, Lord, we need your help this morning. Uh, I need your help this morning. So give me words to say. Give us ears to hear and hearts that are humble and willing to receive your truth and live it out for the world to see. And Lord, we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so let's zoom in a little bit real quick. We'll zoom in, and I'll give you some context, because as I was preparing for this, I mean, we're not working through this book like we normally would with a book where we go verse by verse, and you kind of know what's going on with the story. So I'll kind of set the scene for you a little bit and help us understand. This is a familiar story for many of us, um, but hopefully some of this information can kind of prepare us 
uh, for what we might need to receive this morning. So this is in the context of Jesus' last life on earth. We know all about Jesus' earthly ministry, all the miracles he did, all the uh, teachings he said, and all the things that he prophesied and said would happen. We know all about that. And he's walking into uh, his last week of life and his last week of ministry on this earth. And up until this point, much of his ministry had, in a sense, been somewhat veiled. You know, he would do a, do a miracle and say, don't go and tell anyone. He, he would say things, but it was somewhat masked just a little bit to not stir things up and, and not cause a bunch of divisions. Uh, but here, this is the first time when Jesus begins to unveil who he is and what he has come to do. He's walking into Jerusalem, and he is boldly making a claim that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And this is a day that marks the beginning of his last week of uh, life on this earth. And like I had mentioned, this is the Passover week. It's a week full of celebrations and festivals and food and fun and gathering and remembrance. Uh, Many scholars would say that lots of Jews in this time would take time to go back and read the account of the Exodus, when when God saved his people from the Egyptians. And we'll flip there. You can flip there with me this morning. I don't remember if I have it on the screen or not. We'll go back to Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12, and we're going to look at verse number 21. I do have it on the screen. Awesome. Awesome. So Exodus 12, 21, we'll recount this Passover and understand what's going on. Then Moses called all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go and select lambs for yourselves according to your clans and kill the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and touch the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. None of you shall go out of the door of this house until the morning. For the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians, and when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you. You shall observe this rite as a statute for you and for your sons forever. And when you come to the land that the Lord will give you, as he promised, you shall keep this service. And when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? You shall say, it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover. For he passed over the houses of the people of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians but spared our houses, and the people bowed their heads and worshipped. You can flip back to Luke now. But this is, this is the context that we find ourselves in. This is the scene, the heart posture of the people of Israel that we are walking into, that Jesus is walking into. It is a heart posture of remembering all that God had done for them and celebrating it but also looking forward to the hope of this Savior, looking forward to the hope of this Messiah. And Jesus comes in as that Messiah and enters the scene. We see in verse 28 that he said these things. He went on ahead and going up to Jerusalem. We see the names Bethphage and Bethany. Those are cities. If you've got the map pulled up, this might be a little helpful. So if you see on the map, it's hard for me to see that far, Uh, You see in the bottom right corner, uh, I believe that's Bethany. Is that Bethany? I can't read. Okay. Bethany, Bethphage, and then you see Jerusalem as you kind of go north and then a little bit west. Um, That road there that you see, the kind of red road that goes from Bethany all the way up into Jerusalem, it was a Roman military road, and that journey from, so it went all the way through those cities and it went all the way down to Jericho, and from Jericho to Jerusalem was roughly 17 miles. But in the scene we find ourselves in today, so we see Bethany's kind of there, Bethphage, and then into Jerusalem. From Bethany to Jerusalem is roughly a mile and a half to two miles. So about a 30 to 45 minute walk. Um, If you're going slow, maybe an hour. If you're taking time, talking, about an hour's walk. And so this is kind of where you see the scene taking place. So he's coming kind of from the southeast, making his way up a little bit north, and then into the west. He's going over the Mount of Olives, you can see there in that valley and then making his way down into Jerusalem. And it really is cool because Audrey and I actually had the privilege to go visit Jerusalem recently, and we actually got to stand on the Mount of Olives, and I was reflecting just kind of on that scene, and I actually had a picture. I didn't send it, but I should have. It would have been cool. A picture from the Mount of Olives where you would have likely seen Jesus kind of descending down the valley into the temple, into the, uh, the gate of Jerusalem, 
Um, so that's where we find ourselves today. You see this. It's about a two, two mile and a half to two mile walk that you see Jesus going on and venturing back and forth. Um, he was likely, many scholars think he went into Bethany or Bethphage uh, the Sunday before this and had kind of spent some time there. Um, so that's where we're at, specifically on a map. Um, but we also see, as we look at the text, uh, something about a donkey. And uh, Audrey speculated this week, I'm calling you out, sorry. She speculated uh, that the donkey might have been a crazy donkey because she was confused as to why the donkey had to have no one have ridden it. So we'll get there. (laughs) So verse 30 talks about the donkey, says, Go into the village in front of you where on entering you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. And uh, a lot of prophecies were fulfilled uh, in Jesus' life, his ministry, his death, his resurrection. Um, I think scholars speculate somewhere over 300 prophecies, individual prophecies from the Old Testament were fulfilled in Jesus himself. This is one of them, the donkey. You'd be surprised, but it is a prophecy that was fulfilled. We see in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Very specific prophecy, very specific prophecy that was fulfilled in Jesus, and the reason the donkey wasn't ridden is because it was prophesied that it wouldn't be ridden. So hopefully that answers your question. Hopefully it answers Audrey's question. I'm sure she'll be happy to know that. Um, A foal is essentially just a young donkey that has yet been put to use or put to service. It's It's a fresh, unblemished, unused donkey. And so this prophecy in Zechariah prophesied that this exact thing would happen. Jesus was aware of this. His disciples were aware of this. The Pharisees were aware of this. Um, and this is him fulfilling it and making a bold statement that, yes, I am that person. We also see another prophecy uh, fulfilled in this, and we read it actually. Grant read it as our call to worship this morning from Psalm chapter 118. It says, Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. In our, our passage, we don't see the word Hosanna in Luke's account of this, but all three other accounts, they say the word Hosanna. And literally, the word Hosanna means, save us, we pray. And so this chant that they were chanting as Jesus is entering into Jerusalem is literally a recital of Psalm 118. Save us, we pray. O Lord, we pray, give us success. And you see the excitement, you see the hope, you see the joy, you see the expectation that they have as God's people longing for this Savior. But also in our passage, you see a hint of tension, almost like a foreshadowing of the week to come. In verse 39, you see the Pharisees enter the scene and say, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. The Pharisees, as the religious leaders of the day, were very familiar with what was taking place, and they did not like what they saw. See, the the Jewish people in the first century, even some of the people that were following Christ, um, but specifically some of the Pharisees, the religious leaders, those who were uh, familiar with their Old Testament, they had a certain expectation of what this Messiah would look like. They expected him to come in and, and overthrow governments, overthrow religious authorities, and kind of establish this kingdom right in front of their eyes. They wanted, in a sense, liberation from some of the Roman oppression, but he came with a very different mission in mind. He brought salvation. And the Jews today still look back at Christ and fail to see what he did as a fulfillment of these messianic prophecies. And I was looking, I spent some time this week kind of trying to understand the mind of common Jewish people today, why, what do you do with Jesus? What, why don't you believe this was a fulfillment of prophecy? And I came across a quote from Rabbi, Rabbi Tovia Singer who said, and it made me really sad, if you wanted to know what it is that the Messiah is not supposed to do, look at the Christian century. The Christian century perfectly outlines the reciprocally opposite of what is supposed to occur in Messianic days. 
And that is the heart posture of Jews today. That was the heart posture of many Jews back then. They had this expectation of Jesus to come in with this very loud and proud and political overthrow to establish his kingdom, to overthrow oppression, and to make their pe- his people safe, secure, comfortable. But we see in 1 John 3 that the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil, which is far more than just any political oppression that we can ever face. It's far more than any religious authorities that are exercising over us. Jesus came with a very different purpose in mind, a purpose far deeper, far wider, far greater, and far more profound than they could ever expect. And so that's a little bit of the context when we're zoomed into what's going on this week. It's a story many of us are familiar with. We've seen it in stories and and kids' stories, kids' books. We we know this scene. What I want to do for the rest of our time this morning is zoom out. I want us to take this scene, take what we know about what's happening, take what we know about the Jewish people then, about the Jewish people now, and kind of understand what caused some of the problems that might have been happening in the minds and the hearts of these people. You see, when Jesus came, they had a certain expectation for him. They expected him to act a certain way, look a certain way, do certain things, and save them in a certain manner. But they were met with something very different. This week transpired in a way that would crush their hopes and dreams and ultimately leave them hopeless. And when expectations aren't met, there's a laundry list of problems that can arise. I think the foremost problem that can arise when you have unmet expectations is discontentment. It actually hits real close to home for some of us. This past week, Gallup released their World Happiness Report. They release this report every year. And uh, it released some shocking information about our country in in particular. It's a 158-page report, so if you have some free time, feel free to go read that this weekend. (laughs) But in it, you see that the United States has hit an all-time low ranking for world happiness. All-time low. This year, we ranked 23rd in the list of countries for world happiness. They speculated that the largest influence of this data was young individuals. Young individuals on their charts were categorized as people aged 30 and below. For those people, so my demographic, and younger, we ranked 62nd on the list of world happiness. Those in the old category, and that's age 60 plus according to them, so if you have a problem with 60 being old, take it up with them, not me. So the old category actually ranked 10th. So that's really interesting that you see this huge discrepancy between the younger generation and the older generation in our country. And you can speculate all you want about what might have caused that. I have my own opinions. I'm not a huge fan of smartphones. But you see this huge discrepancy, and you see just this trend in our country, in our culture, in our generations, especially the ones that are being raised now. You see this trend downward in terms of happiness, satisfaction, contentment, joy. I mean, the fruit of the Spirit. You see a lack of it in our generation. So this is not a problem that we are unfamiliar with. And so this morning, with the concept of discontentment and expectations, I wanted to present to you, I think this is somewhat some some meditation in my own heart, just on looking at the passage and understanding what might have caused this discontentment. But I want to present to you what I think are five habits that lead to discontentment when when expectations aren't met. So five habits that lead to discontentment when expectations aren't met. And I'm sure this is not exhaustive. There's all kinds of reasons that one could be discontent when your expectations aren't met. But as I was meditating on this passage this morning and just trying to get into the mind of first century Jews and modern Jews, I wanted to understand what I thought might lead to this problem. So discontentment and expectations not being met is where we're going to zoom out and focus most of our time this morning. But growing up, I played a lot of sports. Um, some of my favorite trips growing up were baseball trips because baseball, I don't know what it was, but baseball was the one sport that when I played it, I just could enjoy it. I didn't have to think a whole lot. Like you practice throughout the week, but once you go play, there's not a whole lot you can do 
besides just show up and perform. And so baseball trips were always the most fun because we would go typically as a team, find a hotel. A lot of our out-of-town tournaments were, were specifically and strategically placed near water parks, near amusement parks, near other stuff so that parents could make the baseball trip a little bit of a vacation for us as well. But I remember the trip specifically, and I love, love, love baseball trips. They were just so fun. Uh, but about baseball, the thing that I remember the most is actually when we got to the age where we could actually have our own home field advantage. So it wasn't until, I think, middle school is when we were able to play on the high school field and call that our home field. So anytime we hosted someone from out of town, we would play on that field. And there's many advantages that come with having a home field advantage. One of them, you get to go sleep in your own bed. You don't have to drive. You don't have to wake up early. You don't have to deal with travel, packing, all that stuff. It just makes life a little easier. You also can have more supporters, more fans supporting you. So more family can come, more friends, more loved ones. They can come support you. And two, we get to practice on that field the whole week. So I know exactly where the potholes are in the outfield. I know exactly which rocks to avoid in the infield. I know how many steps it takes to get to first base as I'm rounding to second base. So there's lots of advantages that come with home field advantage. I didn't really care about those as an immature 14-year-old, 15-year-old boy. The thing that made me most excited about having a home field advantage was the fact that I now could have a walk-up song. <laughs> if you're not familiar what a walk-up song is, every single one of us teenage boys got to pick a song that would be played when we get introduced to walk up to bat. I don't know what my walk-up song was, but I'm sure I would change it if I knew what I know now. <laughs> but the purpose of a walk-up song is really... There's a handful of purposes. One of them is really just to kind of like hype yourself up. You get excited. You walk up to the bat, up to the plate. You get ready to bat. You just have this mindset. You're ready to go. But it also helps you express kind of your character, a little bit about you, a little bit about who you are. But I read earlier uh, this week that walk-up songs actually set the tone for your entire at-bat. They can set the tone for your entire outbat because you're communicating to other people, you're communicating to yourself, you are really fixing your eyes and your mind and your heart in a certain direction, and you are going straight ahead. The problem was, I had this awesome walk-up song, got all the way up there, and would often strike out. <laughs> so what, what do we do when we strike out? What do we do when we set all of our mind and our heart and our ambition and our goals in a certain direction and things aren't met? That's the problem we find ourselves in. So there's really two things you can do. You can either change your expectations, lower them. They always say shoot for the moon or aim for the moon. If you don't miss, make it, you'll land among the stars. Well, you could just not shoot at all. Then you'll be happy with whatever you get. So you can either change your expectations or you can change your heart when you aren't met with the right expectations. And this morning, as we consider our story, our context, uh, the, the Palm Sunday story and Jesus' triumphal entry, his ministry, his life, and this week to come, in the same way to the at-bat walk-up song, Jesus has set the tone, expressed his character, and in a sense tried to raise expectations for the people around him. But Jesus was not naive, and he knew that expectations wouldn't be met. In Matthew 11, before this scene, he says, Blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. So Jesus knew what he was doing was going to stir some feathers. He knew what he was going to do, what he was doing was going to miss the mark of someone's expectations. But he enters anyway, enters in anyways, and expectations aren't met. And here are the five habits that I think lead to discontentment when expectations aren't met. The first one I would theorize is that we are not in communion with God. So when expectations aren't met and you are discontent, I would argue that it is largely in part due to the fact that you are not in communion with God. Like any relationship, like your marriage, like your friends, like your coworkers, like your family members, you must be in communion with them. You must communicate with them in order for things to function as they ought. Just think about this practically for a second. If you have a job and you don't talk to your boss for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks, and your job does not go according to plan or how you would expect it to or how your boss would expect it to, we're not surprised. We understand that in our jobs, in our relationships, we have to communicate in order for things to go smoothly. 
But for some reason, for whatever reason, when it comes to our faith, we get to just play the get out of jail free card all the time. We just say, you know what? Like, I'm good. I just got Jesus, my coffee. I go to church every Sunday. I go to city group every week. I'm good. I've, I, I'm, I'm communing with God. But then life happens, and habits take hold, and day after day after day turns into week after week after week, into month, into year, and then you've got a habit of not communing with God. So what does communion with God look like? What does a pursuit of it look like? I actually really, really like Jonathan Edwards. He has a statement of uh, resolutions, he calls them. And in a couple of them, he mentions what this looks like for him. He says, Resolved to cast and venture my soul on the Lord Jesus Christ, to trust and confide in him, and consecrate, dedicate myself wholly to him. He goes on and says, Resolved very much to exercise myself in this all my life long, with the greatest openness I am capable of, to declare my ways to God and lay open my soul to him, all my sins, temptations, difficulties, sorrows, fears, hopes, desires, and everything and every circumstance. This is what it looks like to pursue communion with God. It is to cast all of who you are, all of what you have, all of your goals, your hopes, your desires, your struggles, your temptations at the foot of the cross to trust in him, to long with him, to commune with him, to pray to him, to sing to him, to spend time with his people and be reminded of our goal and our ambitions, to spend time in his word, to read his very words that he gave us. Celebrate communion. That's a very practical and tangible symbol of what it looks like to commune with God and his people. We learned in Galatians just recently that keeping in step with the Spirit, what that looks like to keep in step with the Spirit and how that changes our life and how it impacts our thinking and our heart and our joy and our peace. So we keep in step with the Spirit. It really is just defined by discipline. Discipline yourself and develop the habit of communing with God. You think of John 15 where he says, Abide in me and I in you. The concept of abiding and loving and spending time with, like this is not just some relationship where we check the box of I'm saved, now I'm going to go about my whole life and do anything and everything I want and totally disregard God until it's comfortable for me, until I'm happier, I want to, or I have this little inkling of, of fire lit under my feet, so I go and just start to dig a little bit more, but then I'll go back. I mean, that's the balance that we all deal with. There's seasons and waves and flows of of all of us in our varying degrees on wanting to do this. But our life, our posture, our motivation should be marked by one of just casting ourselves on the Lord. And so I would argue that is our first habit that leads to discontentment when expectations aren't met. But many of us think they are communing with God today, but they merely changed God to fit their own mold. And so this brings us to our second habit that I think leads to discontentment when expectations aren't met. It's that we are trying to make God more like us. So when things don't go the way we planned, when things don't pan out the way we think they should, And we become discontent. I think the reason, one of the reasons we get there is because we are creating idols. We're making God more like us. And we think that God, all he wants is for us to be comfortable, happy, rich, wealthy, healthy. That's the God that I serve. And anyone that pulls me in a different direction, well, that that can't be the real God. It's picking and choosing certain attributes, characteristics, and actions that we like most and just kind of making our own little image of God. Ignoring the stuff we don't like and picking the stuff we do like. And typically, what we choose when we make an idol are the things that offend us the least, that make us the most comfortable, and that relieve us of as much responsibility as possible. 
That's our tendency. When we make idols in our life, they typically are threefold. They, they relieve us of responsibility, they make us comfortable, and they don't offend us or anyone around us. And this is the first and second commandment from Exodus. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven or above. And I don't want to belabor this point because we went through this in the Ten Commandments series. And if you want more encouragement on this specific top point, I'd encourage you to go visit the sermons that Grant preached on both of these. I uh, listened to them this week and pulled two two uh, quotes from them that I really liked. In the first commandment, he said, God deserves and desires to be our one and only God. And then on the second commandment, we wrongly want to make him more like us, and much of our worship can become us trying to make him more relatable and similar to us. And so in order to not beat a dead horse on this point, I'll just read a handful of passages pertaining to this, uh, and then you can meditate on them this week, consider in your own life how you might be making God in your own image, what idols exist in your life, and how you can kind of start to weed those out uh, so you can be more content and so you can be more faithful to our Lord. So Psalm 115, their idols are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths but do not speak, eyes but do not see. They have ears but do not hear, noses but do not smell. They have hands but do not feel, feet but do not walk, and they do not make a sound in their throat. Those who make them become like them, so do all who trust in them. Romans 1 For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Habakkuk 2.18, What prophet is an idol when its maker has shaped it, a metal image, a teacher of lies? For its maker trusts in his own creation when he makes speechless idols. And then Isaiah chapter 43. I won't read the whole passage, but I'd encourage you to. It's all about the foolishness of idolatry. All who fashion idols are nothing, and the things they delight in do not profit. So the reason why, or a reason why, many of us become discontent when our expectations aren't met, it's because we have idols in our life, things that we worship more than God. We have to remember that we are made in the image of God, not the other way around. And when you fail to remember this, you can guarantee that there will be discontentment right around the corner, just one unmet expectation away. So that's our second habit. The third habit that I would theorize that leads to discontentment is that we have too tight of a grip on our desires and the things we currently have. When expectations aren't met and when we feel discontent or unhappy, it's because we have too tight of a grip on our desires or the things that we currently have. And Audrey and I just recently watched uh, all of the Willy Wonka movies. I think we skipped one of them. But we watched the new one, the Wonka one about him growing up, and then we watched the original one from like the 60s, I think, Uh, one of the characters in the original one is Veruca. I think it's Veruca Salt. She turns into a blueberry. She's the one who says, I want to... No, she falls down the golden egg. She's the golden egg girl. She wants a golden egg. She wants an Oompa Loompa. I want it. I need it. Daddy, I need it. I want it. I want it. I want it. That is the heart posture of our culture. That is the message that rings in our ears every time we turn on our phones, every time we turn on the TV. I want it. I need it. It's mine. I have it. I want it. I need it. I need it now problem is God owns everything. Even the house that we own, the car that we own, the money in our bank accounts, the kids that we have, our relationships, God owns everything. And so for us to think just for a second that we cling so tightly to these things, we can control them, we can manipulate them. This is mine, and anyone that takes it from me, you have committed an offense towards me. It's foolish. And so when we have a tight grip on our desires, when we have a tight grip on the things that we have, we have to remember this truth, that God owns everything. Psalm 24, the whole earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell within. Haggai 2.8, the silver is mine, the gold is mine, 
Exodus 19, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. And then in Job, right after Job's family and children were taken from him, he says, oh, I guess I don't have it on here. That stinks. Job 41. I got the reference. We'll flip to Job 41 real quick. Job 41, right after Job's children and his family are taken from him. Job 41, 11. He says, who has first given to me that I should repay him? Oh, just kidding. That's not the reference. We'll get there. <laughs> I jumped ahead of myself. I do have it written down. So Job 41, 11, Everyone, everything is the Lord's. Who has first given to me that I should repay him? Whatever is under the whole heaven is mine. So we have to remember that everything that we have, everything on this earth, everything belongs to God. We are just merely stewards. We've been entrusted with the stuff that we have to use not just for our own selfish gain or for our own glory, but for the glory of God and the good of others. And so the money we have, the children we have, the relationships we have, the home we have, everything that we have is not something that we want to selfishly use for ourselves it's something that we should strive to use for God's glory, for good of others. How can we serve God and how can we serve neighbor? We have to have an open hand with our stuff and with our plans. Just think of Proverbs 16, 9. The heart of man plans his way, but the Lord is the one who establishes his steps. Having an open hand doesn't just free you from being enslaved to what you already have, though. It also allows you, it gives you the opportunity to receive whatever it is the Lord wants you to have. So like our church building situation we're in right now, this is a discipline that we as a church body, as members, as brothers and sisters are having to exercise discipline in. We have a beautiful gift in a building, in a place that we get to gather. We have a beautiful gift in people that come regularly and fellowship and serve and love and care for one another. And we long for, we, we're ambitious, we're desirous of a growing church, of a, another space where we can utilize it more and have more opportunities to serve the community, our neighbors, each other. We long for that. But the second that we close our fists and think that is what we deserve is the second we start making poor decisions. It's the second we stop leading the right way, serving the right way. And it's the second we are met with an insane amount of discontentment. The last thing we want is to walk into this building that the Lord has given us and for a second think, ah, this isn't good enough. It's a gift the Lord has given us. And our Father knows exactly what we need. Just remember the words in Luke, what father among you, if a son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? It goes on to say, if you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more? Will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Our Father knows what we need. Our Father is wise, far wiser than us. So anything we have or don't have, it's because of His perfect will. Job chapter 1 is what I had referenced um, earlier. When Job's children and his family and everything seems to start falling away, immediately after his children and family are taken from him, what does he say? Job chapter 1, verse 21. The Lord gave me, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And that's a really hard situation to imagine. We wouldn't wish that on anyone. But would that be our heart posture if it happens? Whether it's your children, whether it's your family, whether it's your job, whether it's your money, your car, your house. If or when it is taken from you, if or when your dreams crash and burn, can you say with Job, the Lord gave me and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So the things that we have, the desires that we have, we need to loosen our grip on them. We need to not have such a tight grip on them. And when we do, it'll be easier when expectations aren't met, to not be met with discontentment, for us to actually have joy and for us to be able to say that the Lord is good. The next habit, I think, that leads to us being discontent when expectations aren't met is that we have the wrong perspective. 
So along the same vein of having a tight grip on things, we think that the things on this earth are all there is. We think that my job, my family, my money, my house, my car, my goals on this earth are what really matter. That I need to lay up treasures here and and build a nice house and have a bunch of wealth and build up a, a name for my family and something to pass on to my kids. Those are all good goals. We need to not forget that it all passes away. That this life is but a blot a little dot on the line of eternity. We have to remember in Matthew 6 that we shouldn't lay up for ourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, but rather to fix our eyes heavenly. The habit that causes us to be discontent when expectations aren't met is that we have the wrong perspective. We look at things through a very narrow lens And like Grant had talked about, I don't remember which sermon it was, he talked about the reason that we aren't um, satisfied in God is because our goals are too selfish and too small. We have to seek the kingdom of God and His righteousness first. Let that be our goal, our perspective, our outlook on life, not the things of this earth. There's a famous tale, a famous story about a farmer and a horse, and a son. Um, Many of you have probably heard it, just about a horse. A farmer who has a horse, the horse runs away. Everyone says, oh, I'm so sorry for you. It must be bad. You have bad luck. And he goes, eh, we'll see. And the horse comes back and brings eight horses with it. And they said, oh, you have such good luck. He goes, eh, we'll see. Then his son is riding one of the new horses and falls off and breaks his leg. And they all say, oh, you have such bad luck. He says, eh, we'll see. And then they go to war. Everyone comes in to draft all the able-bodied young men to go into battle and his son with a broken leg doesn't get drafted and they all say, oh, you must have good luck. And he says, eh, we'll see. Just a fun little story that the way we often tend to think of life and success and our path, our journey is very narrow-minded. It's often very earthly, very tangible, very physical, very measurable. But the way that the Lord works is often, I would argue all the time, far above our thinking. Why did this happen to me? Well, we can figure out five or six different reasons why we think it might have happened to you, but at the end of the day, the Lord's the only one who knows for sure. So we have the wrong perspective, and this is, this is the dance of the Christian life, isn't it? Because we live in a world with real families, real jobs, real money, real houses, real feelings, real emotions. It's all stuff that we can taste, smell, see, and touch. And so how do we interact with all of this stuff but recognize that there's a far greater reality going on? It's a really interesting dance that we have to learn and understand and master as we go about our life as Christians. There's a podcast that me and several other friends listen to as a saying that the world is not just stuff. It's a simple statement, but it's really profound because we tend to think, we tend to look at everything in the world that's going on around us and think it's all just stuff. Stuff that I feel, taste, see, smell, touch. But we have to remember there's a lot more going on behind the scenes. Ephesians 6 touches on this, just that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, cosmic powers over this present darkness. There is a spiritual reality to everything that is happening on this earth. And we are, as God's people, to discipline ourselves to be reminded of that and to try and think that way in any situation we encounter. Colossians 3 says, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are on above, not on things that are on earth. And it's really hard to do, especially when we're met with challenges and trials and hardships and loss, because all of those things tend to try and pull us back into the here and the now. 
But we have to remember that all the things that happen here happen for a greater purpose. In 2 Corinthians, Paul is exhorting the Corinthian church to not lose heart. He says, Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day, for this light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. So as we go about life in this very real and very tangible world, we must discipline ourselves to fix our eyes vertically. The next habit, and I'm going to try and rush because I realized that this is taking longer than I thought. <laughs> the next habit is that we are selfishly comparing our lot to others. When expectations aren't met and we feel that discontentment arising within our hearts, it's largely in part due to the fact that we are selfishly comparing what we have to what others have or what we don't have to what others have. There's a famous saying that comparison is the thief of joy. I might dampen your mood. I think that's false. I don't think comparison is the thief of joy and I don't think comparison is inherently bad. I mean, any accountability that you have in your life, any kind of stirring in you to get better or grow or continue to be sanctified, that has to have some degree of sancti- or com- comparison in it. I mean, you think of just Paul where he exhorts the Corinthians to say, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. That has to have some degree of comparison in it. I can't be an imitator of someone if I'm not comparing my current state to their state. He also urged Titus and Timothy to kind of set an example for others to follow as leaders in their faith. So comparison isn't inherently bad. It actually can be a very good thing. It stirs us up to grow and to be sanctified and to to love others and to become more like Christ. I mean, we compare ourselves to Christ all the time. Obviously, we fall short every time, but that is still our aim, to become more Christ-like. The problem with comparison is when we try and do it selfishly or pridefully. Imagine for a second that you're a crop farmer. You've got a field of crops, and you can look over at your neighbor who's doing the same things as you, and you can compare strategies, tactics, plans, equipment. You can compare all of that stuff, and that's good. It's going to help you become a better farmer. But you do all of the same things that he does. The season comes and the season goes, And for some reason, he yielded more crop than you. Even if you did the exact same thing. The fact is that we can work, we can plant, we can water, but ultimately God is the one who gives the growth. So we can compare and grow and be sanctified and held accountable, but when we look at our neighbor who got more crop and with a selfish heart we compare, that's when it becomes a problem. We say, well, I wanted more crop. Well, I wanted more money. I wanted more of this. I did everything right. Why didn't I get this result? So when selfishness creeps in, that's when comparison starts to waver. But also pride. When you do get more crop and you compare to other people and you say proudly, I got more than him. I'm better than him. I'm boasting in my own self and my own work. That's when comparison can rob your joy. Think of the passage in Ecclesiastes where it talks about uh, the work of God. I think it says, like, consider the work of God. Who can make straight what he has made crooked? Just the reality that God is the one who, who alters our paths, who gives the growth, who pulls back some of the growth. And we foolishly think that we are the ones that can control that. God is the one who gives the growth. And that frees us from selfishly or pridefully comparing our lot to others. But it also reminds us that when growth is slow or when immediate results aren't seen, that God is still at work. And this brings us to our next habit that I think causes us to be discontent. It's that we are obsessed with tangible growth and immediate results. 
I think this is in large part due to the, the happiness or lack of happiness that our country is beginning to see because consumerism is continuing to feed our minds and we want tangible growth and immediate results. And as one who's trying to start a business and trying to do it well and, and, and wisely, all of the voices that teach business tactics, they go right here. Tangible growth, immediate results, Input, output, profit, and loss. It is a tendency of our day and age. And if you remember back to seventh grade math class for a second, you're likely familiar with, uh, I think I've got the, the formula on the screen. There you go. If you remember back to seventh grade math class, you remember this formula. Does anyone know what it is? Slope. Slope. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> This is the formula for slope. M equals y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Slope equals rise over run. And many of us want this answer to be positive. When we look at our life, we want the slope of our life, we want the trajectory of our life to be trending upward. Problem is, that's what we expect. Reality is very different. If you click to the next slide, I remember seeing this in college one time. That's often what life looks like. We expect this very steady, gradual growth, but life goes like this. For most of us, we prefer this to be positive. The problem is life rarely works like that. And for this point, I'm going to highlight our spiritual growth. I want us to, to really consider growth in terms of our sanctification, our spiritual maturity. It should be trending upward. But... You can replace the y-axis with any other variable, and the same holds true, assuming that you have aligned your perspective and your desires with that of the Lord's. So I want to provide for my family more. I want to be excelling in my job more so that I can make more of an impact for God's glory. I want this to be changing or growing, producing results in my life. So what do we do when life doesn't work out like we thought it should? What do we do when growth isn't as tangible as we thought or as immediate as we expected? We have to be reminded that God is still at work even when growth is slow, stagnant, and the results aren't seen. Again, back to Proverbs 16, 9. We can plan our steps, but the Lord is the one who guides our path. He is the one that gives the growth. Growth and sanctification in the Christian life are not as tangible or immediate as we would like. Exercising patience is very difficult, especially in our culture. But we have to remember that sanctification is a process, that this life on this earth is even more than a marathon because marathons end. But after this life, we have eternity, and so this is a long, ongoing growth that we will see in our lives. And as I'm wrapping up, I'll read a quote from a, a passage or an article that I read this week regarding sanctification. Scott Hubbard, he works for Desiring God, John Piper's Ministries. He wrote an article on this, and he said, The pictures of growth that God gives us in his world bid us to take the long view of sanctification. They shift our expectations from the fast to the slow, from the immediate to the gradual. We are farmers planting crops in Galatians 6. Grace grows in our souls much like God's kingdom grows in the world. The seed slowly sprouts to the sky. The crops slowly fill the field. We plow and sow and water and watch and bear fruit only with patience. We are children growing up. Like all children, our bones grow slowly. We move from milk to solid food on our way to looking like our elder brother. One day we will be like him, but only when he appears because we shall see him as he is. We are runners in a race. This race is not a sprint nor even a marathon, but a lifelong jog. Only when we reach the end of our lives can we say, I have finished the race. Until then, we run with endurance, like Hebrew says not wasting our legs in the first 100 meters, but pacing ourselves to the end. We are travelers beneath the rising sun. Light is scattering our darkness, but only a shade at a time. 
Our path is like the light of dawn, which shines brighter and brighter until full day. Christ's glory rises over us from one degree of glory to another. We are farmers, children, runners, travelers. Each of these images reminds us that deep, pervasive holiness happens over a lifetime. God's word slowly reframes our perspectives on ourselves and the world. Jesus gradually extends his lordship over even the most ordinary of tasks. The Spirit steadily makes obedience in certain areas habitual. God renews us not at once, but day by day. And this is the, the last habit that I'm theorizing that leads to discontentment. It is thinking that we need immediate results and tangible results. Look back at our text for today as we close Luke chapter 19. It's kind of our text to today. It was the springboard into where we went. Verse 38. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. This Palm Sunday and throughout this week as we prepare to remember what Christ did on the cross and at his resurrection and his ascension, let us look back to the life and memory of ministry of Christ. Let us remember what he has accomplished. And as we're doing so, let us be reminded to commune with him. Let us learn to know and love the one true and living God, not an idol that we create. Let us loosen our grip on our stuff and our desires and hold fast to Christ. Let us be reminded that hope that surpasses all knowledge and understanding, that hope of eternity. And let your perspective be shaped by this heavenly reality. And as our perspective is shaped, let's remember to not selfishly or pridefully compare what God has given us with others. And then lastly, when growth and results aren't as tangible or immediate as we would like, let us trust in the finished work of Christ on the cross. Expectations will not always be met. In fact, you will probably encounter more unmet expectations in your life than met ones. The Jews in the first century certainly had expectations that weren't met. But when we are met, with unmet expectations, let us not cease to cry out the praise of Jesus' disciples in Luke 19.38. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Blessed is this King, King Jesus, who humbled himself to our likeness and brought salvation to his people. Let's pray.